Indiana State University. Um, I just started streaming on our other account, realizing I was on the wrong account. So here we are. I hope I'm I'm hope I'm in the right place. Um, I wanted to let you know that we are having a little bit of a hurricane here, not a big one, or the tail end of a medium-sized hurricane. I'm not sure, but anyway, if I disappear, I am uh, I'm probably okay. It's just that my power went out. So uh, today on our Twitch stream, um, we're going to be doing a little bit of sewing. Uh, I learned to sew about a year ago, um, and and well, I I'll say I started sewing a year ago, and I've been learning ever since, uh, bit by bit, project by project. I started sewing um, to help a, a colleague out with a project that she was doing. She wanted to to do a sewing workshop for students at our library here in North Carolina, uh, at North Carolina State University, uh, and so I said, well, I'll help you out, but I have to. I have to learn how to sew. I borrowed my mother's sewing machine, uh, and I haven't given it back. So I've been I've been practicing ever since. This is uh, it's a Singer sewing machine. It's part of their heavy duty sewing machine line. It's like forty five something. I don't know. It's it's got a number, and it's it's not obviously emblazoned anywhere on here. So. Anyway, um, we're going to be using this machine. It is, it's, it's kind of a fairly basic machine. It's worked really well for me. Um, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not, maybe I think it was like 200 and something dollars when my mom bought it a few years ago. So, you know, it's certainly not the fanciest sewing machine, but it, but it, it does the job. Um, so today we're going to be, um, I'm going to kind of talk you through a pretty simple sewing project. Um, we're going to be sewing um, uh, some coasters, some drinks coasters, right? So in, um, look, I look like this. Uh, this is a finished, finished one I did a, a few weeks ago, um, hexagon shaped. And uh, I, I just I rarely just imagine something I'm not that good yet. Uh, so I usually start Googling, watch some YouTube videos and, and figure out um, how someone else has done it. So I downloaded a very um, simple pattern um, from orangebetty.com. I want to give credit where credit is due. I did not make this up. Um, so uh, if you go to, it's called the Modern Hexagon Coaster from orangebetty.com. If you, if you want to look it up yourself, Anyway, um, so a lot of patterns, they come, you print, you can print them out and they'll give you, usually I've, I've already cut this out. It, it had a two piece cut out. Um, and, uh, they'll give you kind of a little inch guide, you know, just to make sure that you're, you've printed to the, to the right scale. Um, just make sure everything's the right size. So I printed these out and, um, and just, ooh, it's getting windy. Uh, and I, you know, cut out, it says cut out one piece of backing fabric um, from the larger hexagon. So that was this, like, um, if, if you were to think you were gonna use kind of two, ki two kinds of fabric, like a heavier fabric and a, um, like a thinner fabric, the, the thinner and potentially more decorative fabric would be your backing fabric. And then um, the smaller hexagon you would cut out from, you know, your thinner, more decorative fabric. And also, because this is a kind of a very simple quilting project, in order to provide some layer of heat resistance or absorbency for your coaster to really work, um, you would want some kind of interior fabric. And again, that, that could be anything, um, but you would cut it out to the smaller hexagon as well. Hi, Christopher. Nice to see you. Um, we're just we're just starting a sewing project here, so feel free to ask any questions as we go along. Um, so anyway, what I thought I would do with this project is also kind of combine it with some of the sustainability stuff the library has been working on. Um, you know, you, there's there's so many different kinds of fabric you can buy, and so many fun patterns. Um, recently, uh, my husband was 
trashing some old clothes. And I said, wait, hold on. Let me, um, let, let me sort through those. And I, I rescued um, a pair of his old chinos, Banana Republic chinos, some good sturdy fabric, and, um, and a, a work shirt that he, I think, broke through the elbow on. Um, and so we, uh, I got that. And then we have endless numbers of dish towels that become so stained that I'm even embarrassed to use them. So I grabbed an old dish towel and, um, let's see, it's, it's pretty badly stained, but I figured I would use that as my interior batting fabric. Um, it's pretty thin, but, um, but I'm not, I'm not really trying to make it these coasters super heat protective. Uh, one thing that you want to do when you're sewing is, um, is iron your fabric, uh, wash it first and then iron it. Um, any fabric when it's new will shrink when it's being washed and you want, you want it to do its shrinking before you start uh, cutting and sewing. So, um, this is, well, since these are all pretty old, uh, clothes and and this towel is pretty old i i knew they were they had been washed and dried to their point of maximum shrinkage but i did go ahead and iron them ahead of time so um you should if if, if you're going to start sewing and you you're going to pick up some material supplies and, and equipment um in addition to a sewing machine you probably want to make sure you have you have a um an iron but you should probably have that anyway uh so I traced out these piece, these pattern pieces onto this fabric. I did it before we, we started this stream. So I'm just gonna go ahead and cut them out. Uh, bear with me here. Um, you'll, another thing that you, you might want is a, is a decent pair of fabric scissors. It really does make um, quite a difference when you're cutting, when you're cutting fabric. So, um, and then once you, and they're not too expensive, $15 maybe. Um, and then you want to guard it with your life. Don't let your children or your roommates or anybody take it to cut paper, pipe cleaners, um, what, I don't know, I don't know, tape. You don't, you don't want to get it gummy and gluey. It makes it really hard to cut with. So I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a stickler about keeping my fabric scissors where I know they are. So I'm just cutting and they cut really crisply and nicely. I also, um, when you're sewing cotton, especially, and these are all cotton fabrics, um, when you're sewing, you'll, um, or ironing rather before you sew, uh, it helps, especially when you're learning, uh, to starch the, the fabric before you iron it. it, it'll just help it hold its shape a little better. And so, whoops, you, know, you can get it at any supermarket, like a fabric starch. Um, and it, it just makes things hold more nicely. The fabric doesn't wiggle and stretch. So um, we've got our backing fabric there from the, from the shirt. Where was I going with my, oh, here we go. This is, this is going to be the, the front fabric. And again, you can see it's like, when you starch and iron it, it, it almost like lays like paper, which is it's kind of fun. So anyway, I'm going to cut this out now. I, uh, I've spent a, some time kind of looking at, you know, different tools of the, of the hobby, the craft, the trade, whatever it is. Um, and there are all sorts of irons you can get. And I, I'm, I'd love to play with one, but they can get really expensive. I've wondered, like, what is what does a hundred and ninety dollar iron do for you that um, the twenty five dollar iron doesn't? I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've watched YouTube videos, and they just look like an iron. Um, maybe they have more temperature control. I don't know. Anyway, I I bought. I have an iron that I keep for clothes, but. Um, I bought an extra one just to keep here by my sewing table and it was, I think it was $20 and it does the, it does the fine. Yeah, I don't, I don't, <laughs> it's 
got the best heat. Yeah, it would be interesting. I, I once took a, um, a very long drive with my dad and we stopped for like takeout, you know, like at the supermarket hot bar. We got to the hotel and we didn't, the hotel didn't have a microwave. And so my dad put the, I'm sure the next person in our hotel room didn't appreciate this. He just turned the iron upside down and put his, his takeout container. It was like a paper tape, not plastic, but he put his paper takeout container on top of the iron to heat it back up. So I suppose there are lots of different things you can do with an iron. So I'm just cutting out the, the center piece of fabric. I hope I remember to like wipe that iron down after, before, before we checked out. It was an interesting, it was an interesting trip. We drove from Los Angeles to San Francisco and at some point we decided we would kind of drive through the mountains uh, near Yosemite. And it was, it was like the very early spring and they stopped us and they said, you've got to get snow, snow tires. Oh, you can make a good grilled cheese. You're right. Um, with an iron, but they told us we needed snow tires or, or buy snow chains. And we're like, we'll, we'll never need those. It's, it's like early April, but we did it anyway. And oh, were we glad we got them because I thought, I mean, it just, once we climbed up an elevation, the snow started coming down and started hailing and, um, it was, yeah, snow chains were a good, good move. All right. So I have all my pieces cut out now, right? Um, and I'm going to, uh, I'm actually going to switch cameras here so you can, you can see my work surface. Let me just figure this. I'm going to go right here. Hopefully. No, that didn't work. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to this one. All right. So, um, I'm going to bring you around here. So what we'll do here is, um, We'll kind of lay them out in this pattern, right? This will be on our back and then we'll kind of line them up, line them up like that. And so what we're going to do here is, uh, you'll, if you're doing this on your own, I'm going to tilt this down. We'll, you'll fold the edge in halfway and then fold it over again and then pin it. Let me get my pins. So get these pins, pin, the old tomato pin cushion. Somebody recently told me, a colleague, um, that I, I never understood. You've got the tomato and then the little strawberry um, hanging off and the strawberry is filled with some kind of sharpening powder and it's meant to sharpen your pins. Um, someone asked, is the document camera on? I thought it was, but it doesn't seem to be wanting to activate. I did have it set up earlier and working. Oh, is it a chili pepper? I don't know. I've always assumed it was a strawberry, although a chili pepper might make more sense to go with um, with a tomato. I've never really liked strawberries and salads, but I would take a chili pepper in a salad. Um, yeah, let me just fiddle with this document camera really quickly. I've got this document camera that I was going to point at the sewing machine, and I oh wait, here we go, magic. All right, let's see if that comes back. If I go to the next scene. Hmm. Doesn't want to work. All right. We'll go like this. Okay. So I, I did an example here before we started. So you do a half turn in and then you turn over again and you pin and you keep going around and there might be some kind of math here for 
how many turns you do so you have it anyway I didn't figure it out um, and then you know I, I won't drag out my iron now but in an ideal world you'd, you'd kind of press these down and you'd make them stick so um, but I'm gonna just I'm gonna pin these down right here so you can see The wind has died down. Let's hope it hope it keeps up like that. So, I guess I might want to make sure it's lined up with the with the grid of the shirt, you know? And then turn it once. Get a little sometimes especially if you've starched it, you can get a little press. And it might, yeah, increase a little bit like a piece of paper, right? That's that's another advantage of the starch. And give it another little press, and then um, pin it down. Try not to stab yourself, although I do it at least once in every sewing project. Every time I sit down, anyway. My kids reorganized all my pins in a tidy grid. So twist it over. This looks like like one of those like little galette treats, you know, like the pastry folded over and filled with chocolate in the middle. It's getting to lunchtime. I'm getting hungry. So third side, fold it over. These may not be entirely even, but the effect of this looks like you might put these coasters in a log cabin somewhere. There's all sorts of fun fabric you can pick up, match your decor, your sense of fun. It's probably not my decor, but ow, see, I did it. Got myself with the pin. I don't think any blood was drawn. There we go. And in we go. Another turn. I'll have to figure out who I'm going to maybe send these to as a Christmas present or something. Never sure, you know, what people want for gifts. I'm not the world's best gift giver. I think we all tend to give people something that we'd want ourselves. Then maybe we should just not give gifts and just, I don't know. Anyway, that's a tangent. All right, so I'm on my last, my last pin. Last one in. So a sewing machine has um, a number of different settings. Um, you can set stitch length and stitch pattern. I'll show you here. Um, so oops, orientation. OK. So this is the stitch length. Um, and I don't, I don't know what like what actual unit of measurement this corresponds to. I've never actually looked that, looked that up. But anyway, um, a tighter, like a, a shorter stitch is a, is a tighter stitch. The stitches are more closely spaced together, and um, the you know, longer you get, a, it's a looser, more openly spaced stitch, and won't be as strong a stitch. So I'm going to keep this down to like somewhere between one and two. And then down here, there's all sorts of stitch patterns. I'm still learning about them myself. Um, but we're just going to use a straight stitch here. And then each on each dial, like there's like multiple 
multiple options. So on the top dial, there's these setting one, setting two. If I if I were to have it here, then it could do like a um, side by side stitches were actually pretty interesting. I think I um, read somewhere like it's it's good for providing a little bit of flexibility in fabric if you're um, sewing an area of a garment especially that might need to stretch a bit. Um, similarly with the zigzag stitch, some people like to use it at the edges to stop something from fraying and again to give a little bit of stretch. Um, and I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about the rest of these. What I learned recently was this one is just to, um, to sew a buttonhole. I want to, and there's a special foot, a special presser foot that you use um, to sew a buttonhole. And I, it came with the sewing machine, and for the longest time I looked at it and I thought, what's that? Um, and then I, I saw a YouTube video about it. Um, so I need to try that out soon. But right now I'm just using kind of a, a normal, this might actually be like a Teflon presser foot. Very often you see them in metal. Teflon is going to slot like let's um fabric slide under it a little bit um more smoothly i was recently sewing with um i was sewing with oil cloth i was making a different kind of coaster with oil cloth and that can be a little sticky and grabby and a teflon foot is pretty good for that um oil cloth is the kind of i'll loosely call it fabric i think once upon a time it really was more fabric now it's it's basically vinyl um, with a very loose cotton weave on the back of it. But um, anyway, it, it it wants to stick under your presser foot a little bit. So um, that's why I've, I had put the Teflon foot under there, but it's, it's pretty multi-purpose. And so I had hoped to sew little um, kind of snack sandwich bags out of the oil cloth. So I ordered way more of it than I really need, especially since this oil cloth is pretty stiff and it, it wasn't, it wasn't working well for what I wanted it to do. Um, so anyway, the presser foot feet, presser foots, presser feet come on and off pretty easily. You lift a little lever at the back. You can't really see it, but, um, you lift a little lever at the back and you pop it on there and then I've already threaded this. I've just selected um, a, a color thread that isn't too far off what I'm sewing. Sometimes contrasting thread is fun, but um, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's nice for it to blend in. I think if, if your thread contrasts a lot with your fabric, your sewing has to be super accurate and straight. And so, um, I tend to like to let it blend in so nobody can see my mistakes. So you have the thread that comes across. Most sewing machines have a, you know, a numbered guide. So it goes through this hook. This is a lever that goes up and down when you, oh no, sorry, this grabs it. And then this lever, then it goes through up here around this lever, down behind this and ultimately through the needle. Um, this sewing machine does have kind of this this feature, this little thing, and it can thread the needle for you. I honestly don't find it super helpful, but um, it's it's just as easy for me to just thread it by eye. And then underneath you have the bobbin, and that's the kind of thread that comes up and hooks around your top thread to create a secure stitch. That's as technical as I'm really able to get on this. I'm not super mechanical. So, um, so we've, we've set our stitch length to about one. Oh, let's take it off the, um, the buttonhole stitch. I'll go back to the straight stitch. Oh, the number of times I've found that I've, you know, I've switched over to the zigzag stitch and then I go back to sewing, I discover I, I was still on the zigzag stitch and I'm genuinely annoyed at myself. So, um, what was I saying? I don't know. At that point, yeah, you can either just accept the mistake and it's part of the the character. Yeah, I'm gloating about my needle threading. Um, or you, you, some people are pretty perfectionist and they'll just rip out any mistakes they have. Where's my, 
Okay, this is one of the things I think my children has wandered off with, which is peculiar. Oh wait, here's one. You have a seam ripper. And so it's a little tool that allows you to go in and just rip out any, um, yeah, any stitches that you, you're unsatisfied with. Another thing that I find super useful to have about is a tiny pair of scissors. Um, either like little, little miniature versions of normal scissors or um, this I just find super useful. I, I don't have to put my fingers in it. It just kind of scissors in and out with a little grab. Um, and I, I wind up using it frequently to either trim off loose threads from something I've just sewn or kind of clip something off. What I did rather late in the game, only in the last few months, discovered this little nub. Ooh, you can't see it here. There is a nub to the side here, and it's got a tiny little, it's got a tiny little razor blade in there. And so you just kind of run your thread in here and snip it off when you're finished running a line. So anyway, let's uh, find my, my pedal somewhere underneath the desk. We'll, we'll get started. So I'm going to find one section that runs, yeah, end to end. And how did I do the last one? I think I just did, I just did one stitch. You could, depends on how you like the way it looks. You might just run one stitch at the very edge here, or you could do two um, side by side. So you um, line things up. You can also change the needle position. Um, I have my needle as far to the right as it can go. And then I lower the presser foot that grabs on. There are also these little grippy things underneath your presser foot. Those are called um, your feed dogs. Um, and what they do is they kind of, they grab your fabric from underneath and keep pulling it forward. And that kind of moves, moves your fabric along when you're sewing, um, certain kinds of fabric or, um, or like fabric in multiple layers. Um, there's a, there's another kind of presser foot and it's, oh, I forget the name of it, but it has feed dogs on the top. And so you can pull that fabric um, smoothly through. All right, so this might get noisy. I'm going to stitch forward. Um, oh, it would help if I turned the machine on. Uh, I'll stitch forward two stitches and stitch backwards two stitches uh, just to kind of anchor that first stitch. This machine, I can stitch backwards by holding this down simultaneously when I... Um, push the pedal on the floor. So I'm going to go forward and then backwards and then I'll go forwards again. Let's keep going again, you know, a, a perfectionist will try to make sure their lines are very, very straight. There are, um, there are special pens you can get to mark a line on your fabric if you really want to make sure that you're, you know, kind of going according to plan. And they either, um, this, I've gotten to a very thick part of the fabric and this is a pretty, has a pretty powerful motor, but, um, sometimes it really does struggle. I also don't know how sharp my needle is. I haven't changed it in a while. Um, so sometimes if I just, I can bypass the, the motor and, um, turn, if I turn this towards me, it'll actually operate the motion of the needle and I can get it kind of, I can control it more and get it through the thicker part of the fabric because right here where I, I have the, the patterned fabric folded over, it is probably trying to get through five layers of fabric. So it, it struggles a bit. So, um, so with the needle still in the fabric. Um, I'm going to try to pivot this and I'll, I 
lift the presser foot, but the needle is still in, so I can kind of make an angle. And I'm going to take this pin out, and I'm going to put it back in my tomato. I get a little nervous about, you know, rogue pins wind up in someone's foot. But I was, I was, was starting to say about these pens, they can either, they will either disappear, the ink will just disappear on its own, or some are iron out, you know, um, they'll just, the moment you apply heat, that ink will disappear. Um, so some people use those. I don't like them very much, to be honest. Um, and usually when I'm needing to write on fabric, it's gonna be on a part of the fabric that I won't see once it's all said and done. So I'll just grab um, kind of a fine point washable Crayola marker. Um, I have little kids, so we have a lot of them in the house. And I know it'll wash out ultimately when this item is washed. Um, and it, it does, it just it deposits its ink onto the fabric really um, more, more liberally than some of the specialty sewing pens, but I, I haven't tried all of them. Um, there's always chalk as well. Chalk is, uh, you know, you just wipe it and it comes off. If you're trying to mark out where you're going to cut or so, it's less accurate. You can, ooh, here comes the wind. Oh, boy. Okay. Oh, goodness, this is really thickened up here. Every now and again, um, and I hope it doesn't happen again today, because I'm going to watch me take my sewing machine apart. You know, I'll get, um, it's usually if the fabric, and I've only recently learned this, if the fabric comes off of this, um, I forget the technical name for this, but this little um, arm that goes up and down, if the thread comes off of that and you don't notice it, all your thread is going to start bunching up under the bobbin and you're going to wonder what on earth is going on. But um, I learned the hard way after taking the whole machine apart practically that that's, that's what happened. Oh yeah. I've seen those little there, like um, a piece of chalk that looks kind of like a, like a, a leaf or as Dave says, a, a, like a blade. And that is, yeah, that's pretty useful. I haven't, I haven't gotten one of those. I know it would be taken outside and used for like driveway art. And that would be sad. So, and you just take the pin out as you kind of come to each spot. I've also recently, especially if I'm if the pin is running perpendicular in the fabric to my sewing direction, I'm gonna just leave the pin in there and uh, you know, 19 times out of 20, your needle will jump over it. Then the one time in 20, it doesn't jump over and you either bend your needle or, I don't know. I'm going to get through the thicker parts of the fabric here by hand crank. has some good qualities. Um, quietness is not one of them. Um, it's it does make it a little tricky. Like if I wanna if I wanna work on a project and someone's trying to watch TV, I have to wait. I am on a um, I get like an, an email from Bernina, the the store that sells. I go there to buy fabric because it's pretty close to my house, but they also sell sewing machines. And we do have a Bernina sewing machine in the maker space at the library. We have several um, sewing machines in the maker space. Um, and they have, they do have a Bernina. They're different levels of Berninas, but on the, on the top end, I would like, I was wondering like, why are they offering financing on this sewing machine? And I was like, oh, this sewing machine is $19,000. So yeah, I'd, I'd need financing too. But anyway, I'm sure it has all sorts of features that this doesn't. And I would hope at that price, it's also super quiet. So um, I've sewn around all six sides. 
and I don't think I'm gonna do a second line here I think I'll just um kind of cut off the threads this is this is something I'll often get my kids to do because they're always asking how they can help um, so I'll just use my little scissors and cut you sit here sewing long enough you're covered in these teeny tiny threads um, yes uh, I, I should have made that very clear we do not have a $19,000 Bernina in the maker space no way um, like I said it, they, they come in a big range um, <laughs> but uh, that we do have sewing machines we have an embroidery machine I recently got to use um, the serger that we have in the sewing machine uh, in a project that I'm working on with some other colleagues. I'll actually show you. It does such a cool edge stitch. So um, I'll, I'll plug a workshop that we have coming up um, in the first week in December. I think we're planning on it for December 4th. I don't know the exact date. Um, but we're making fidget quilts. And uh, if you don't know what a fidget quilt is, it's like a little it's a blanket. It could be a big blanket. Some people make these into books, like little busy books for kids, but you just attach little items onto it, which you would fiddle with, right? Um, these are frequently used uh, for children, little kids. Uh, it, they're often used in dementia care facilities for people who are just kind of playing with things. Um, they just need to keep their hands occupied. Um, and then also um, they're tend to be often useful for people who have other sensory processing disorders. Um, you know, they, they just need to keep their hands occupied. Um, they kind of fill a function of, you know, almost like the, um, the fidget spinners for, for people with attention deficit, you know, just something to keep your hands busy. So anyway, we're, we're going to be doing this workshop where we will, um, if you sign up, we'll send out a kit with a, um, a quilt sandwich. And a quilt sandwich is, it's like three layers, right? It's the back, it's the, the middle, the, the batting in this case. So um, for this, the coaster we made, right? I just used an old tea towel, but um, quilts, if you're making a proper quilt, they'll usually get like a wool or a cotton um, non-woven, usually uh, fabric to put in the middle. They come in different weights. Um, and, then, and then usually kind of a decorative front. And so on this, we're sewing on different little things, buttons, um, a zipper, it's a fun zipper, a little ribbons to play with, buckles. But the serger allows you to kind of do this, um, oh, it's an, called an overlock stitch, and it cuts the edge at the same time. So it cuts and overlocks as it goes around. And so the kit we'll be sending out has a quilt, we'll have a quilt sandwich with the, um, with three sides sewn, one side open. So you can kind of get your hand in there and kind of put, put it on like a big puppet and sew on the different elements. And we're gonna be talking um, through some basic hand stitches, not, not sewing machine sewing because um, you might not have a sewing machine at home, but there are some some basic hand stitches that are super useful. Um, how to sew on a button. We'll talk about how to uh, do a blanket stitch, which we'll use to sew up the fourth side of the quilt when we're done. Um, kind of a straight running stitch and, and a back stitch, which is like a running stitch, but a little bit more secure. So we're going to talk about those four four hand stitches in that workshop. So I encourage you to check out the library's website and, and sign up. Um, and we will, we will, we can ship you the kit and you can join us, uh, not on Twitch for, for that one. Um, we're going to be doing that one in Zoom. So we can, in addition to you seeing us, we can see you uh, and kind of help you troubleshoot what it is you're working on. So anyway, that's, that's a serger. That's one of the things we have in the makerspace at Hill Library. So I'm going to sew up the my second example here. If there are any questions, do we ever offer sewing machine 101? I always end up with bobbin issues. Uh, I'm not, you know, I don't I don't work in the makerspace that much myself, but I don't know if our um, chat moderators here might know. We've we've done um, probably done, done some 
hand embroidery workshops recently. But yeah, have we done? Oh, yeah, we do. We do do Sewing Machine 101. It would be interesting if we could combine. We have, we've done like little like repair workshops, like repairing small items. Um, we could combine the repair and the Sewing 101. Repair your sewing machine. Mm, yeah, that's in normal times when we can have people in our space together with us and oh, it's um yeah these the sooner we can get past this this time of social distancing the better i think we're all getting lonely Ooh, my mother's struggling here i think i really do need to change my my needle There's a horror story in my family of my grandmother. Um, my, my, both my parents um, are Irish, born in Ireland, and so they have and so they have these stories of like things that I couldn't imagine happening here. But also, like Irish people have a flair for drama, and they really love gore. And anyway, so my dad loves to tell me about how my grandmother sewed right through her finger. like genuinely shocking the number of people in my family who lost a finger at one point. Some of them were reattached. Not all. Yes, she, she obviously had a sharper needle than I have. It's also like, I think she probably had a treadle machine. So I'm wondering how she managed to do that. I could see like if you were just pushing, to, maybe maybe she had a, a motorized machine at that point actually. It would have been the maybe 50s. Although my dad, my dad who's 80 can can tell you about when they got electricity in his house growing up. So it was it was within his lifetime, sometime after 1940. Okay, so sometimes, and this is probably my fault for like, probably not ironing this before I started. So my fabric is starting to bunch under my, um, under my presser foot. So with the needle down, just gonna make sure it's fully down. I'm just gonna lift the presser foot and I just like to have, I, I think this is, this is probably to hold thread somewhere at the top, but I just kind of use it and it, I use it just to shove that fabric back in there. I just lift that, flatten it down, put the presser foot back down, and go back to work. I love this little case. Look, and here's here's actually an extra needle. No, no, it's just a bag for a needle. But I do have a little little box of extra needles. They're not expensive. It's good to have them on hand. And you know, there there are some guidelines for like you should change your needle every. So many hours I've never really held to that it's like it's like you should change your buy new running shoes every I don't know 200 miles or something I'm like oof. I mean I haven't run 200 miles in a long time so that's not a problem for me now but when I was running I'm like how am I gonna afford to keep myself in shoes is this just a gambit by the sneaker industry probably down pivot it pivot I'll keep going got four sides down two to go so the as I mentioned before the the thing that got me sewing was our first fidget quilt workshop um, last, last fall. And so I, um, you know, I've managed, to, ouch. Usually it's best to have your like needle so that you can pull it towards you. Anyway, okay. Okay. Your 
pin rather. Um, so I started, I started learning to use this machine for that workshop. And then, um, my next project was I, I made some, I made some placemats for my brother. He bought a new house and I wanted to send him a house when I get And then he found out he was having a baby and I thought, wouldn't it be fun to make a blanket for the baby? But I didn't want to send them like my first ever practice quilt. So I, I found a, a kit. Um, like a lot of fabric companies will kind of plan out a quilt for you and um, send you the pattern and send you all the fabric you need. And this one came with like a really helpful set of YouTube tutorials. And so I just spent, you know, it, I just worked on it little bit by little bit, but I think it took me about three months and I got this quilt and then I thought, well, let me, okay. So I'd, I had that under my belt and then I, I made a quilt for my brother and a quilt for a friend who was having a baby. Baby quilts are nice a nice size you know, or like a, a lap quilt, especially with a machine like this. One of the things you have to do, like once you stitch it all, like stitch the top all together is make the quilt sandwich and quilt the top to the middle and the back. And so if you think you've got to get that quilt through this machine somehow, and this section of the machine is called the, th the throat of the machine. Exactly. You need a long arm machine. <laughs> and that's probably where you're getting into the $19,000 machine, right? You get a, a super long arm quilting machine. Um, so I haven't, I haven't attempted like an actual bed size quilt, but um, I did find some, like there are places where you can, you can do the quilt top and then, and then send your quilt to someone to just do the, the quilting. Um, so, uh, so on the, on the practice coaster, I did, um, just to figure this out, I actually did quilt the, the top to the bottom on a item this small. It's not strictly necessary, but I was playing around with it and I just kind of made this star pattern on it. So maybe we'll try, um, just quilting, quilting it together. Um, there are, um, there are, well, two styles of quilting. There's probably loads of styles of quilting, but there's there's quilting that you might do with, um, you know, in straight lines. Or sometimes you see a quilt that's put together and it has like all swirly stitches on it, and that's um, called free motion quilting. A machine like this isn't really great at free motion quilting, but if you wanted to attempt it, you'd get a different presser foot, and you'd you'd there's a way to pull down the feed dogs, right? Cause the feed dogs want to bring your, your fabric in one straight line. But if you're free motion quilting, you're kind of moving your fabric in a swirly pattern underneath the needle. So you don't want those feed dogs trying to move your fabric in the direction that you don't want it to go. So uh, on this machine, I pull, pull off this and there's a button at the back and I can pull down those feed dogs but I'm not going to do that. So another, another thing that's um, super important to have in your arsenal is a ruler or lots of them. Um, and then this is actually one of those pens I was talking about. This pen, I think it's like, uh, I think it's one of those iron off pens. So I'm just going to draw myself a line because I don't, when I'm, when I'm stitching along the edge, I can use the edge of the fabric as kind of to eyeball the fact that I'm going um, on a straight line, <clears throat> but kind of, kind of stitching straight through the center of this, I'm pretty sure I'd go all wobbly. So I'm gonna just draw myself a line. One end to the other. You see it just makes a pretty faint line and it will come off when I ultimately iron it. So I'm just going to draw that. I'm just going to, I'm not going to do the full star, but I'll, I'll cross it along the three main lines. And then of course, after I finished those quilts, coronavirus happened and I got into the mask. 
business. Not a business. I just made lots of masks. I for my family, friends, and then when my kids went back to school, their school supply list was so different from previous years, and it was like 15 masks each. So, uh, and bottles of hand sanitizer and all that. So I made sure everybody had enough masks. And I've, I've played around with different, different patterns. Bye, Dave. Thanks for joining us. Um, but I don't know. I, I feel like um, we are sufficiently masked now. So I don't, I don't know what I'm going to work on next. I feel like it's time to learn something new. I've like had it in my mind that maybe I might try garments. I do have a pattern for like a little girl's dress. Might might try that out. The problem is is that um, it's it's so much easier to sew with cotton, but a lot of kids' clothes, you know, kids like the soft softness of jersey, just like a it's a knit fabric. It's really hard to sew with. Unless you have a serger. Apparently that's the way to go. And there we go. I'm going to cut it there. And then you always wind up with like a little, little tail and it's, um, it's really annoying, but if you, if you don't leave the thread long to start, um, then you'll, when, when this bit comes up, it'll yank the thread out of your needle and then you'll wind up re-threading every time there are, you know, sometimes I, once you finish off sewing one thing, it's often useful just to sew a piece of scrap fabric in and then just have it there so that you don't have to leave su such a long tail of thread um, and waste and waste your thread. So I should do that more often. I'm, I'm not, not really good at keeping up with that. But then you're, you won't yank your thread right back through your needle. But yeah, Jersey is just, it's, it's a stretchy nightmare. I tried making some masks out of Jersey and I, they, they were all a disaster. None of them turned out well. Um, it also might've been the Jersey I was working with. Um, fabric is, uh, yeah, it's, it's not all made alike. Some is better than others. So we just have a kind of pinwheel here and um, you can just set your Set your tea or your coffee on it, your glass of water. Um, I actually, the fact that we used a tea towel instead of actual batting, I like because it, um, to feel it, it's not spongy, right? Um, you don't want kind of a, a spongy surface to set a glass on. I'd be afraid it would kind of tip over. So, um, so this is, it's pretty firm. I can like feel the table through it, but I, I, I feel also very confident that I wouldn't get um, kind of water rings on a wood table or even a heat stain if I put a, a cup of coffee or something on, something hot on it. There is, um, you know, this could be a project I might take on. There is specific heat resistant backing or batting, and it's got kind of like a, a metallic layer, reflective metallic layer. So maybe I might try next making kind of... Um, Trivets or, you know, pot holders. That might, that might be fun. Could use it some of my fabric stash. Are there any, any questions before we wrap up? We've got three minutes. I'm feeling pretty lucky that our power didn't go out in this time. Well, if you are um, in Raleigh and 
affiliated with NC State. Once all of this is over, I definitely encourage you to come in and check out the makerspace, a lot of the equipment we have in there. One of the, one of the real great features of, of a lot of the technology and tools that we lend is, you know, giving people access to something that they maybe can't afford or don't know if they like ought to build into their budget without trying it out first. And that goes from you know, anything from, you know, GoPro cameras to virtual reality headsets to um, drawing tablets for, for, you know, art and graphic design and the sewing equipment, right? Um, so definitely, you know, when, when we're back open, which we will be at some point, um, come in, check it out. You might find a new hobby. Um, I warn you, your family might not like your new hobby, but um, that's tough. Uh, our moderator here also mentions that um, there's a there's a virtual tour of the space coming up. And uh, again, I also I, I encourage you to um, soon on our website you'll find um, a link to our fidget quilt workshop, and I, I'd love for you to join me. I'll I'll be there in that workshop with um, my colleagues Tori and Malika, and we can we can do some hand sewing together. Again, I'm not an expert. I'm still a learner, but I think that's the exciting thing about about things like this. We can we can learn something new, and I think um, this pandemic has kind of prompted a lot of us to, to kind of just you know st stretch our wings, expand our horizons, do something that we wouldn't have done when we're so busy running around, getting from one place to another. We've got a lot more time um, indoors, alone, um, and for me, there's only so much TV I can watch. Um, and and the, the thing I really like about a project like, you know, a sewing project, especially unlike cooking is like you can you can stop and start it. Right. You can say I'm going to work on it for 10 minutes and then, you know, not come back to it for a day or two. And, and it, it hasn't spoiled. It hasn't gone off. It, um, you know, you, you you haven't you haven't lost any progress if you if you walk away from it for a little while. So I, that's 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 why this is a hobby that works pretty well for me. Painting wouldn't be very good. The paint would uh, the paint would dry. I would you know. So anyway, well it's it's one o'clock and I I thank everyone who joined us today and um, hopefully we'll see you soon. <laughs>